Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us on a cold Saturday morning in Indianapolis. My name is T.E. McHale. I'm the manager of motorsports communications for American Honda. And this is the second year that American Honda and HPD have sponsored Derek's driver development seminar here at PRI. We have a couple of new things to tell you about, and I'm going to let Derek elaborate on those when he's up here. Obviously, most of you, I think, know about Derek's successful racing career in both Formula One and Indy cars. And we're pleased about the association that Derek will expand upon when he comes up here momentarily. But uh, just as a general um, comment, the development of young drivers is very important to Honda and Honda performance development. And we're particularly excited about the opportunity uh, that has resulted from our partnership with Derek. So I know he's got a lot of information he wants to cover with you and you don't really want to hear from me. So without further ado, please welcome Derek Daly. Thank you, T. Thank you, T. Good morning, everybody. It's always a interesting decision when we try and decide when's the best time to hold these seminars. Is it early in the morning, which leaves the show free? Is it Friday? No, because the kids are in school. Is it Saturday morning? No, because we like to stay in bed. So we're still trying to muddle around and find when is the best time. But as T says, it is so important for American Honda and HPD to try and provide information, particularly to families of young race car drivers, because quite frankly, families are the first source of investment. They're the ones that will step up and pay the first amount of money. Now, I was one of those lucky few who got to live my dream. My dad sold vegetables in a corner grocery store. We had zero attachment or involvement with motor racing. And I went from a short dirt track outside the streets of uh, Dublin City to five years in Formula One, seven years in IndyCar, and then I was lucky to fall into a 25-year television broadcasting career. And the broadcasting career was what was most fascinating because it allowed me to do a lot of research and understand how this sport works, why certain drivers are successful, why opportunities come to certain groups, certain drivers, certain families, whatever it is. And all, through that fascination, I had a racing school in Vegas, and one year, 1970, uh, 1996, we ran the Team Green Academy, which was a driver's search program initiated by Brown and Williamson. We ran 44 young American drivers through a program over two years, and the amount of information was stacked this high from the floor because all of these drivers were so different, so unique, so individual, and it began to give me a framework of how drivers, being so unique, require somewhat of a specialized development program at times, and my interest and my passion very much has been how could I maybe use the information or the experience that I've been through, good and bad, to potentially help young drivers of the future. Hence the seminars, and hence the book that I had published about five or six years ago. Because I had a young son, Connor Daly, who at 10 years of age said, I'd like to have a go in a go-kart. And he's been in a racing car almost every week for, the rest for, for his life since then. He happened to get up early this morning, and he's sitting right here beside another young early riser, Spencer Piggott. But when Connor, and Spencer for that matter, came up through the junior series from karting through all the lower classes of junior racing in America, they won all the championships. And I had moms and dads ask me, well, how does my son or my daughter do that? The difficulty is there wasn't a structure I could point them to. If your son or your daughter is a supremely gifted athlete in stick and ball sports, they're already being scouted in high school. There's a college scholarship program already set up to put them into college free of charge. And then if they're really good, they've got a draft 
from NFL or NBA or Major League Baseball, and they draft them, they pay them, they have all the equipment, all the structure, all the coaches, all the facilities, everything for the athlete to step right into. Our sport doesn't have that. The reason I put this book together is because I actually had access to all the people and the information. So I put together the principles of how you develop a motorsports athlete. It's been a very successful book, and of course, it spawned seminars. Now, a lot of you around here have been to the seminars in the past, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into the type of detail that we normally do because today's concentration is going to be on how to raise the funding. Anybody here have any issue trying to raise funding for racing? <laughs> Imagine that. So, if we concentrate on the funding, I want to potentially make this one more interactive. So if you have questions as we go through some of this, please stop me, um, ask a question, and we'll try and answer it, and then move on. But the very first thing that's uh, um, really a signature of this book is the Champion's Pyramid. You're all familiar with that. Maybe one of the things you don't know about the Champion's Pyramid for this year, uh, for the second edition, is what I did is I actually turned the Champion's Pyramid upside down compared to the first edition. Why? Because I wanted to explain to people how delicately balanced your career will be in this sport. Because no matter how successful you are on a particular day or a particular weekend, if the slightest thing goes wrong, this thing goes out of balance and can keel over and collapse. So I put it upside down to try and emphasize in this sport, you've got to be super careful that you begin to cover all the details. Now, the talent identification, which is at the bottom, which is the very foundation, really, I believe, of driver development. I will take just a couple of minutes this morning to again go over that, for those of you particularly who haven't seen it before. Because whenever I show this or explain this to people, when people see it for the first time, they say, I had no idea. I never thought about it like that. For people who have seen it before, it's a great reinforcement for them, again, to be rooted and anchored in what I believe is the very foundation of accurate dry, uh, talent identification. And what talent identification means, that every young driver, and those young drivers here, every young driver has what we now call a talent spectrum, or he's part of the talent spectrum. Now, what does that mean? We're all born with a certain level of talent, but also a certain type of talent. And there's two very clear different types of talent that I became aware of when we put 44 drivers through the program in 1996. And so if we, if we know that there's two completely different types of talent, what would they look like? One is instant reflex talent, and one is feel-sensitive talent. Now, I know you've heard it before, but instant reflex talent, what we've done now is taken it a level higher. That's the red color if you look at our talent spectrum. The field sensitive talent is the blue color. Now, what, what do those drivers look like? Well, the instant reflex guy, he's got the lightning fast reactions. His nerve endings are on fire. His bold response are, uh, to risk is bold. His response to risk is bold. Natural focus, speed. He's just absolutely going flat out. The field sensitive guy, he knows what's going on. He can feel the car. He knows what's going on with the suspension. He can relay that to his engineers. Completely different type of talent. Now, one is not right or wrong, but they're very different. And unless you identify what type of talent your driver has, you may not have the right support system to develop his particular talent. Now, if you look at, if you understand the red, reflexes on fire, you'll actually see football players like this too. Because Peyton Manning is what side? Blue. He's the engineer. He's field sensitive. He understands. He knows every play. He's the general on the field. Brett Favre, he's the gunslinger. Don't tell him what play to play. Just let me get out there. I'm going to rip it, which he did for his whole career. But in racing, the magic happens when you combine your natural talent and add nurtured 
talent to it. Because if you're naturally over the red side with feel or, or um, instant reflex, if you add feel sensitive, do you see how your package then gets more complete? And the feel sensitive guy in the blue, you have to tell him to stop the discussions about setup. Go out now and let it rip. Let it all hang out. And sometimes you have to force him. You have to create that discipline within him. But do you see the purple in the middle? If you add the other side from your natural side, add your nurture, now you begin, you begin to get into that magic purple side when you have both sides of the talent spectrum. Let me give you an idea who might uh, who drivers that might be on, on either side. We know Hamilton is brilliant, gifted, fast, but he'll tell you himself, when he was at McLaren, he relied on Jensen Button to do the setup for the car. Nicky Lauda, three laps, three races before the end of the Formula One World Championship, said Hamilton suddenly realizes he needs to spend more time with the tires, more time with the chassis discussion, but he might have left it too late. Doesn't mean he's right or wrong, he's gifted and he's fast, but he depends on the engineers and another driver to help give him the car that he needs. The other side, Jensen Button, DeFerrin, Damon Hill, Coulthard, Zanardi, Bourdais, all known to be engineering driven, feel sensitive, good information providers. Now here's the magic. The purple in the middle, when you develop both sides, you got people like Nico Rosberg, Michael Schumacher, Dario, Alonso, Mario, Jeff Gordon. These drivers are able to have both. And that's the magic of understanding the very foundation of driver development so as you ultimately have an opportunity to get your driver in the middle. One is not right or wrong, but when you add the nurtured side to your natural side, you are better positioned for success as you go forward. Anybody got any questions on that? Does that all make sense, particularly now that we've added the colors? Good. Okay. So let me move on. Now, I'm not going to spend any time going over the rest of the, the uh, talent or the uh, champion's pyramid because all of the technical skills, communication, mental, physical, desire, and commitment, that's all in the book. And so I'd love you to read the book. I've got free copies on behalf of Honda for anybody here who hasn't uh, uh, got a copy yet, happy to give you a free copy before you leave here today. Okay, this then spawned what we showed everybody last year, which was the X Factor. The X Factor is another level, because all the green is the driver skills that in the book you have to develop talent, technical, communication, mental, physical, but in addition to that, you have to have off-track support skills. A driver may have it, but these young drivers, quite frankly, can't have it. So they need some sort of a support skill around them to help build the package to be successful in racing. That's basically the financial matrix, which is very complex. We're going to go into that in a lot more detail later. You've got to raise the funding. You've got to build a brand. You've got to have serious marketing, and eventually you make it a sponsorship. We broke this X factor down into a five-year increment because the support skills and the driver skills in year one are pretty defined. The support skills in about year two, when you, now you're racing, now you're familiar, now you're on track, the support skills needed for year two are pretty much defined. By about year three, now you're beginning to win races, hopefully. Now you're beginning to learn how to communicate at a higher level with engineers. Now you're beginning to build a brand because you're, being, you're successful on the racetrack. And that automatically leads you to mental pressures which are higher, leads you to a marketing program that's more professional because in year four now you've got experience. Now you've got to be uh, you got you got to surround yourself with higher marketing levels, and eventually in year five, when you're driving big, fast racing cars, the physical need is more. That's why the physical uh, focus comes on there, and then you go to the sponsorship. Now, the matrix is the bit I want to talk about, because I know, having done it, it is pretty challenging for anybody to go ask for money. Asking for money is a challenging concept for most people. 
until you have a system or until it becomes part of your system. And when you go ask for money, when you step into this challenging concept, you absolutely have to activate your personal network. Most people in this room have no idea who their personal network is. They've no idea how far it can actually reach. They've no idea the power of the personal network. You know how we know that? Because I didn't when I started this. And I started in a very basic, simple form. And I'll show you. Back in 1995, I met this guy here on the right side in Ireland, a fellow called Derek McMahon. I was at a racetrack in the north of Ireland. I was told there was a fellow called Derek McMahon at the bar, and he said he's very interested in racing. He's sponsored drivers in the past. If you want to move to England, which is what I wanted to do the year after, go and ask him would he sponsor you. I walked over to him, never saw him before. I, I tapped him on the back. He turned around and said, hello, my name is Derek Daly. I want to try and move to England next year to race in Formula Ford. I doubt I'm going to have the ability to do this all by myself. Would you have an interest in potentially helping me? His only words to me were, he says, I need you like I need a six inch hole in my head right now. I had no idea what to say. I, I, shaked, I shook his hand, I was shaking, I turned around, I walked away. Never heard from the guy again. I moved to England, I won 23 races. The end of that year, I won the British Formula Ford Festival. Two days later, I got a call from him. He said, I watched you for the season. I didn't know whether you had any talent or not. I didn't know whether you had the desire and the commitment to truly do it. He said, meet me in the Dorchester Hotel in London in three days. He said, let's talk about next year. The upshot of it was, we put a Formula 3 team together and that championship year happened the following year in 1977 the year after I was in Formula One the only way that happened I asked the question you might recognize this fellow here so when he moved out of karting I knew I didn't have the financial resources to write the checks to keep him in the level of care that I presumed he might need. So I began to reach out to my personal network. Indec is a company owned by Jerry Forsyth. Some of you probably know him. He was a team owner, Rand Paul Tracy. I knew him because I was doing television broadcasting. I went into his office one day and I said, Jerry, I got a driver who I think might be good for your driver development program. I spent an hour in a meeting with him, he took a lot of notes. In the last five minutes, I said to him, I said, the anomaly of this thing is, this is my son. I couldn't lead with that information. This is my son. He said, I don't think we're interested in signing anybody to a driver development program at the moment. But he said, we will back him for a year. So what that was, was the same thing as McMahon said two years before, three years before, we'll back him for a year. And his on-track success led to a six-year program where he became a significant supporter because he loves to help young Americans. See this here college network? In 1987, I had an opportunity to come back from injuries and to race at the Indy 500. But I had to raise $200,000 to buy a car for a team owner. I walked into the owner of the college network, never met him before, cold call, I had a hand-drawn um, graphic of an IndyCar where his name would be. He agreed to do it, we became best friends, we're friends today, and 25 years later, he said, I want to be involved with Connor also. Personal network. Merchant services. Where's Todd? Just ask me about merchant services. I met the owner of merchant services in the pit lane at Daytona. He was racing the Daytona 24-hour race. I was introduced by a friend of mine. He has a credit card uh, processing company. They said, if you want to generate business for us through your personal network, we'll pay you commissions, which he did. It was a five-year sponsorship that started to pay some of the travel, some of the expenses that were now mounting at this stage. See Cytomax, owned by a guy called um, Greg Pickett. He raced Trans Am. I passed him every day in the paddock. One day I said, hey, I got a son, Connor. 
He's going to try and make it in racing. We're, we're going to need a bit of help. What do you think? He says, ah, maybe 500 maybe $600, maybe 750 which is how it started. It grew to a significant sponsorship that we, we had for five or six years. Delavico, we met him on a go-kart track. Wild man has a son, Devlin De Francesco. Same thing. My point is the personal network that I didn't even realize that I had. Suddenly, I was able to activate it. But the key is, I asked the question. Let me show you another fella. Recognize him? Just won the Pro Mazda Championship. He's from Wisconsin, a hotbed of motor racing. The key to Aaron Tielitz is he had no way to pay for his racing. His mom introduced him to a friend of hers who knew the president of Rice Lake Weighing Systems. Rice Lake is a town, a small town, 30 minutes from where he lived. He picked the phone up, happened to get the president on the line, and said to him, I'm Aaron Tielitz. I have a dream that someday I may be able to make it to IndyCar racing. I'm not going to be able to do it myself. I'm looking for some sort of support to get me off that initial step. Well, Rice Lake loved to support the local community. So local pride was very important to them. That was the reason they said, we'll write a check for you. So for the last five years, they've been writing a significant check, and they're largely responsible for getting him in a position to be the champion to move into Indy Lights today. But the key is, he asked the question. Another example. These are all live, real live examples. This is Garrett Grist, who also happened to get out of bed early this morning, sitting right over there. They were in the same position I was in, you're all in. See Safina here? Safina is one of the largest chicken processors in Canada. They happened to meet them at the go-kart track. All their kids raced together. The Grish said, we're going to try and move off into carts. But the chances are we're not going to be able to do this ourselves. Safina put Garrett as part of their driver development program and began to fund his transition into carts. See Da Vinci, one of the largest pizza producers in Canada. Same conversation, same answer. Yes, we like the sport, so we'll help your son make the development. See Mac Tools here? That's a program that Jeff Gris began to work on two years ago. That was a 20-year-old relationship of somebody he worked with 20 years ago. And he called him up and says, hey, remember me? Do you have anything that's directed towards the youth market? By sheer coincidence, Mac Tools wants to bring down the age of the people who sell tools on their trucks to a much lower level and have young people have the opportunity to be their own boss. They thought a young guy in racing, what a great way to do it. That was a 20-year-old relationship. But he asked the question, and he began to tap into the personal network. I'll show you one more. The reason I'll show you this is because this was a situation where Scott Anderson wanted a race in Indy Lights. The family were no longer in a position to fund any of his program. We came across a company called Holland Canar, based here in Indianapolis. Their specialty is research tax credits for companies involved in research and development. The government actually pays companies to do research and development. Very few companies understand how to access all of those funds. Holland Canar goes into the companies, goes back five years, assesses what they missed, and they literally get a check from the government. Holland Canar began to get plugged into Anderson's um, uh, personal net network of businesses, and suddenly his Indy Lights career, all the races he did this year, completely funded by outside sources. Now, it took a lot of time to put that together, a lot of work to put that together, but the key is, again, asking the question and tapping into a personal network that a lot of people don't even know exists. See this one here? See Call Cap, that name there? Let me tell you how that came about. Was it D'Ambrosio? Who was, who was the Formula One driver that wouldn't do the, uh, the speech? D'Ambrosio, was it D'Ambrosio? Yeah. So, in Montreal at the Canadian Grand Prix, Grand Prix Tours, which is a travel company, takes all of their clients 
to a dinner on Saturday night and they have a Formula One driver come in and speak to them. Before that, they had a simulator race. Connor was involved in the simulator race, Jerome D'Ambrosio, who was driving for uh, Toro Rosso at the time, and two others were all there. Well, D'Ambrosio's steering wheel on the simulator was so bad, he got so incensed by it that he couldn't drive the simulator properly. He jumped out of it and ran and said, I'm not even going to do my interview on stage. He walked out. They were stuck. They had nobody to interview. They asked Connor, would you, would, would you, would you come up and would you, would you be the interview? He said, sure. He went up, did a super job. There were two people in the audience from a company in Kansas City, Call Cap. The next day, in the, uh, in the uh, pit walkabout, Connor met the company and said, we were so enamored by your story last night, how could we get involved? They became a sponsor of his for the next five years. So do you see how the opportunity could be there? And he literally asked them, well, this is what it would take. Would you be interested? He asked the question. Now, asking the question is one thing, but understanding how to package it and build it, and quite frankly, build another business is the key. And this is one of the things I want to explain to people today, because one of the most important foundation stones is how to create what we call this, fi this financial matrix. Because the financial matrix is more than a spreadsheet. It shows the type of support programs that you will operate. So in other words, presume you've started a business, right? We've all started a small business here. By the way, if anybody wants this presentation, Mackay asked me earlier, I'd be happy to give this presentation to anybody if it helps them uh, recall some of the things that we talked about here. But the financial matrix is going to show the types of programs, identify your sources of funding, identify internal sources of funding, which is obviously family, um, shows the cost of the race being a spreadsheet. It shows your gain or your loss, depending, but it actually sets out in a business form what you're going to do. Now, before I go to the next piece of this, let me bring up Jeff Grist, because he has spent way more time than me at a much deeper, more structured level, putting this package together, which I believe can help everybody here understand how you can structure this family business that you have to start if you are going to attract the funding and give confidence to the people that you're attracting the funding from, give them the confidence that they're not just throwing money into a big, black, deep hole. Jeff, do you want to take it from here? Thanks. Check. There we go. Great. I get to, on a Saturday morning really early, follow Derek Daly and have an accounting conversation. So um, I'm going I'm, I'm to apologize in advance if I put anybody to sleep. Um, this is a matrix that we've developed over the years. And, and what it does in principle is it starts to break down this huge, huge, huge task into measurable elements. Derek talked earlier about this is your family business. And, and I'd like you to think of it even further. This is your family startup. And we all know some of the great startup stories. I mean, Hewlett Packard started in a garage. Harley Davidson started in a shed. Uh, think about Facebook started in a dorm room. So probably not going to be a billion dollar idea, but you need to think of this as your startup. And one of the very first conversations that people are going to have is do you know what it's going to take? Do you know what it's going to cost? Do you know all those pieces? When I was doing motorsports development for TRW way back when we did the Joe Motto Top Fuel Drag Program, we also did a number of stuff in NASCAR with folks like Bill Elliott. I used to get presentation after presentation after presentation. Lots of great photos, lots of great pictures of kids up on, uh, up on the podium with trophies, but nobody actually dove into the business side. And what you're stepping into is an enterprise. You're stepping into a business. So we try to break it down into as many elements as we can to try to say, this is what we want to do. This is where we're going. This is what it's going to cost. And in our next guest speaker that we're going to have up, you'll see that this becomes a very, very, very key piece. So think of this as your family startup, this new enterprise that you're beginning. 
This is just a quick, you can see, we just took a little center shot of this matrix. If anybody wants to go into more detail about this later, you know, be happy to do that and have the conversation with you. We break down funding into a couple of, of areas. Startup funding, as Derek mentioned, that's mom and dad money. Investor funding, we're gonna have a little deeper conversation about that in a minute. We talk about sponsorship programs, and we talk about commercial programs. Those are those B2B type programs you hear about all the time. Some of the internal or performance funding that we talk about is winnings, scholarships, fundraisers, team support, you know, when you get that smoke and deal from a team, you wanna capture some of that information. And technical support, all those other little programs that we can pull together from, you know, clothing supporters, helmet supporters, those types of folks. But when you look at this and you go, well, great, investor funding, sponsorship programs, commercial deals, where is that gonna come from? And that's where Derek was talking earlier about building your network, the strength of your network. So when you develop this type of a program, the next step of that is how do I put this together? Who do I talk to? And what we encourage everybody to do is if you know anybody with a pulse and an email, you get them on your list. And you begin to press that list. You begin to emotionally engage them, educate them, and teach them about what you're doing. Get them all in. And you're going to find that generally the people that you know know somebody. So they may not help you today, but as Derek pointed out in his slides, they will eventually help you in the future. Can you flip the next one? And if anybody has any questions, please you know, raise your hand, because like I said, it, you, you throw up a spreadsheet at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning and it's, it's a little bit. So when we talk about sources of external funding, startup funding, investor funding, sponsorship programs, and commercial deals, these are gonna come from that network that you build. All of these folks that you know, friends, family we like to call that, building up your network, all these folks you know from previous work, current work, getting that information out there, getting them all that social media stuff that you do, your press releases, all of that, begins to get them engaged until, as Derek showed earlier, there's that aha moment. Hey, I know somebody. I think we can do this. I think we can put this together. And it begins to grow and grow and grow. When you have your financial matrix in place, when you can say very clearly, here's my career on one page. Here's what, where we're gonna get the money. Here's where the money's coming from. Here's how we're activating programs it begins to give a clearer picture. One of the most important things that the matrix does when we talk about external sources is it really differentiates you. Because I can guarantee you, from my experience over 25 years, rarely do drivers get to that level of business conversation. So everybody gets an opportunity to say, wow, these guys have really thought it through. Because that's the risk side, and Barry will talk about that a little earlier when we uh, introduce him, the risk side because you don't want to get enough to fail, you want to get enough to succeed. And that's where we really try to push this idea of, it's a startup, do your financial matrix, build your network, now you have the opportunity to get out there and pull through the funding. And make no mistake about it, your personal network, relationships are your sponsorships. Forget commercial sponsorship at the, at the early stage, you don't have something to sell that makes commercial sense. Relationships become your sponsorships at this early stage. And as Derek mentioned earlier and pointed out in his diagrams, you can see that everybody that you know today, that you meet through the paddock, that you meet through business, are those potentials. You don't know where they're gonna come from, but if you're not reaching out and asking the question and putting that information out there, you're never gonna get that answer. So it's, it's continually chipping through those opportunities to get through each and every person that you can see and reach. So continually building that list and educating and emotionally connecting everybody becomes really, really critical. So as Derek said, relationships are your sponsorship. We know this idea of local pride is absolutely incredible. You saw the example with Aaron Tielitz. You'd be amazed in your small towns how many people want to help, but they just don't know how. And so you can plug them into your program through, be it a commercial opportunity, be it a sponsorship opportunity, or, as we'll talk about in a minute, an investor opportunity. And, and we have proved over the years that 
the paddock relationships are already predisposed to the sport. You don't have to sell them on the sport. The fact that they're in the paddock, they're already predisposed. Family and friends, neighbors, they're already predisposed because your, your family tells your neighbors, your neighbors tells their friends, they're already predisposed and understand what the mission is. And local businesses, Aaron Teelitz proved, local businesses love to help the local community guy. And when you add on-track success to that, suddenly it begins to fuel it and drive the momentum that we need. Next. Next slide. Yep. Great. So what we're going to do is take from that kind of overwhelming matrix, we're going to look at one area which we think certainly for young athletes, junior athletes, as Derek mentioned, sponsorship, it, it, you need that track record of winning to be able to get a program big enough to talk about sponsorship. Commercial deals, very, very difficult to do. Those B2B deals we hear about all the time. You hear about you know, that kind of driving motor racing. The investor opportunity. All those friends that may not be in a business or may not have a business that needs national coverage like racing can do, we can now look at investor opportunities. And this is where we talk about acting like a startup, acting like an early stage company where you get it going and then you begin to bring folks in. So this is another way to fund your program, bring in an investor. Now what does that look like? Well, let me give you a couple of examples of drivers who used investors, personal investors, to drive their career. Justin Wilson, British driver, connected with Jonathan Palmer in England, did the Palmer Audi series. Jonathan Palmer, who owned the series, thought he was very, very good. Family didn't have the funding to take him to the next level. They created a public company in England, sold shares in himself, it was enough money to get him into the minority Formula One team, then he was in the Jaguar, then he moved to IndyCar. All driven by an investor group. Now, it's not legal in America to do what they did in England, but there are other ways to do it. Have a look at this here. Not a lot of people know Scott Dixon came to America with an investor group from New Zealand who paid into a fund to get him into a car to try and get himself established. He was 10 years paying them back and they absolutely loved it, and he did too, because it gave him the opportunity and positioned him to be successful. Felipe Massa, to this day, is still paying back and is thrilled to do it, an investor who funded his early junior career. Now, you, I don't know whether you recognize this fellow here, Santino Ferrucci, young kid from the East Coast. He's now signed as a development driver for the Haas Formula One team. He has an investor that's been backing his career because he loves the sport and he loves the idea of helping a young American step up onto that big stage. Now, these are all le real live examples current today of the investor opportunity. Now, the one that's closest, I think, to everybody would be this fellow here, Spencer Piggott. Happens to be here to see us. Spencer Piggott would not be where he is today if his dad did not set up an investor package to help fund his program. Um, Barry Piggott is here. Barry, why don't you come up here? But Barry is here to answer a couple of questions to explain to us how this whole thing worked. First of all, Barry, why did you go the investor route? Technically challenged. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so why the investor? Well, we, <clears throat> we tried some of the routes you'd mentioned very early on, commercial sponsorship. And as you say, there's absolutely nothing to sell at the junior levels. So realizing that you know, without the funding, um, there is no career. So we had to find the funding. So uh, we, as you've seen up there, this isn't a new idea, um, but we set up P1 management in 2009, I think it was, and with the idea of um, <clears throat> any future income that Spencer made, whether it was driver, salary, share of prize money, personal endorsements, coaching fees, everything that he made from being a professional racing driver would go into this company and we would sell 25% of it uh, to investors. And um, 
and that's basically the reason we did it because it was it was the only you know the only uh, option and for so, us to do so explain to us the difference when you change from the word <coughs> sponsorship to investment what does that do <coughs> to an investment minded person oh it changes it completely because um, sponsorship but especially at when you've nothing to sell, really, is is viewed as charity, um, or benevolence, or so benevolence, and, exactly. You know, for goodwill. So um, it doesn't go down too well. But as soon as you start mentioning invest, then people take notice. People with with wealth, um, and they know that it's it's a very very risky investment. So you wouldn't normally choose that, but you know they can justify it because it's an investment. No matter how risky, it's an investment. So they lump it in with their portfolio and, uh, and and it's you know that they're, they're comfortable with that and so you then tapped into your <coughs> personal network yep to try and eke out potential <coughs> absolutely I mean we start with friends and family who may buy one share um, and then we um, built a lot of relationships um, over the two or three years we were with uh, Skip Barber Racing um, a lot of older guys you know they've got successful businesses were in that program racing um, with Spencer, and they were a, a great market, if you like, to um, to propose this idea to. And we have uh, guys that bought one share, and we have guys that have bought multiple shares. Um, and one of the guys we met at Skip Barber has become our, you know, our biggest investor so far. And over the year, over the years, I think we're we're well over a million dollars now. We've raised well over, and we're heading towards two million by the time we finished it all. And so with that amount of money and the scholarships that Spencer has won at every level, you see how the constant maneuvering of the package has allowed Spencer to be in a position to develop and, and show his talent. Yeah, there are three, three basic areas of funding, um, none of which is from his family because unfortunately we can't afford it. <laughs> um, there's the investment, there's the scholarships as you mentioned which were obviously a big part of it. Um, and then we did attract some um, sponsorship along the way because investors don't get their name on the car. Their return is, you know, when he makes it and, uh, and they get their financial return. So they, we, the car, that's the other good thing about the investment program, it leaves the car completely open for you to sell some sponsorship if you can along the way. So that was really the, the three um, funding avenues. That was the smallest one is this, the sponsorship. The investment and the scholarships were the two big ones. But it was enough that you know, we managed to get him through karting, just about. Um, basically, since karting, then we've, um, you know, we've not had to find the funding to, and so, to race. And so, so take us through a couple of examples. Do, do they agree <coughs> immediately, yes, I'll do it? Or do they ever come back a year later and do it? How much is their relationship development <coughs> over years to try and keep the package growing? Well, the, uh, the serious investors, the, the family investors are like, say, one share. It's easy to guilt them into that. <laughs> uh, but, but they're not the, the main focus. It's the, the, um, you know, the serious investors. And yes, what, what we've, we didn't just walk up and say, would you be interested in investing? You know, we build the relationship first. It doesn't have to be two or three years, although we do have one investor that it took three years um, to get him to buy some shares. But it can just be, um, you know, a few meetings or a few weeks. And so the doesn't have to. Broad. It could be a couple of meetings or it could be three years. Yeah, just to get to know the person. And the fact, you know, that, that um, your driver is, is performing well in front of these people, that's also a very key thing. Okay, that helps see, enormously. See, that drives everything on track success. Now, people mistake the balance here. Sometimes they think, well, I have to have off-track success raising the money before I can have on-track. <coughs> Believe it or not, it doesn't work like that. On-track success is ultimately what fuels the emotional attachment and engagement off-track, and that prompts <coughs> people to want to keep involved. So there's a slight bit of a chicken and egg situation because you have to get just on track first, but then you have to develop all the skills that we showed you in the Champions Pyramid earlier because it's fueled by on track success. Spencer Piggott's ongoing investor success 
and attracting sponsors. And the, I remember the California Sense deal that you worked on. <coughs> that for was years. A, a Skip Barber um, relationship. And another connection, which was a sponsorship, which you put together. Mm -hmm. All that is fueled by Spencer's on track success. When he wins races, when he wins championships, when you can send your distribution list the news that yes, your driver is now successful, they want to be involved. So it's so vitally important that on track success is directly connected to any sponsorship, any support, any scholarship, any program. Absolutely, it certainly made my job a lot easier. <laughs> That's now, for sure. So <coughs> investors do this not for the return, do they? They have to want to do it. Yes, primarily um, <coughs> they want to help support you know a young American up and coming driver. That's that's the primary motivation. That's the key for everybody here to understand. <coughs> they don't do it because they think they're going to make a lot of money. No. They no, do no. it because their heart says, I want to back a young American. Or if he's a Brazilian investor like Massa, I want to back a young Brazilian. Or if he's a hometown guy like Aaron Tielitz, I want to back our community, our local guy. That's the reason these people do it. So you can give them an emotional reason to do it. That gets you started, and then your on-track success fuels the growth from there. But they, you know, if if it was just they wanted to help a young driver, they'd just give us the money, and that would be it. But it, the the actual, it may be five percent of it. I don't know. But there is an element there where they um, they they in the back of their mind is well, this is an investment. Maybe one day. And I, I also give them the examples of Justin and uh, Scott Dixon and Rubens Barrichello where, you know, Dixon was trying to buy his investors out because they were doing quite well. <laughs> so it can work. I mean, as risky as it is and as unlikely maybe as it is, it can work. So you present that to them. So there is in the back of their mind that, well, you know, if I get my money back, wow, what a win-win. I've helped this kid. I've, I've got satisfaction seeing him grow and go up the ladder. Plus I get my money back. What can be better than that? So there is an element of that, yeah. but it's not the primary motivation for them to buy shares. Right, and it's not yeah. our job to give any tax advice, but when no. these investors lump this into their investment portfolio, if there is a capital loss, it's actually, they're able to write it off from their businesses very often. That's why the word investment tickles a mm -hmm. much different, larger uh, interest level than just a straight sponsorship or benevolence. <coughs> Yes, I, um, I'm not sure the tax um, advantages of it or not, but I know if, it, if the whole thing went, you know, belly up, then they'd be able to write that amount off. Yeah. But yeah. we're hoping that doesn't happen. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions on the investor route that is very successful when properly structured? Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> we set up a, a company, <coughs> excuse me, um, an LLC, and we had uh, 400 units, and we um, we decided we were going to sell 100, so 25 percent, and um, each share is uh, 25,000 dollars, so that would be a total of 2.5 million if we sold them all, and we've got about I don't know 15 or 16 investors now. Some have, like I said, only one share. Some have multiple shares. So that's, that's basically how we set it up. And we have a prospectus that we can show people with graphs and all, you know, Jeff's kind of financial stuff on it. <laughs> uh, and, but that is a key. You, you do have a complete presentation that oh, breaks yeah. it down um, year by year, uh, the development years, the need the driver's going to have, the potential return. I mean, it's all <coughs> properly laid out, thought out, and presented because we, unless you have something like that, the investor doesn't have any confidence no. that you actually have your act together, that you are operating a respectable business that is controlled and measured. Yeah, and we have, um, <coughs> we, we took, I think, six or seven um, top IndyCar drivers. This is all focused on IndyCar, and um, we looked at their career earnings, and we projected it out, and you know, we did a whole um, forecast, basically. Um, and of course, at the bottom of every page, it says, you know, this is no, no way is this a guarantee, blah, 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 blah. And we got the, the driver salaries from some very um, you know, authentic sources, so we know that, that they're pretty accurate. Spencer make any money? Um, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> no. 
Just me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but what he did is he tapped into his resources, his personal network of people to help him put this package together. We had an attorney that put the, the LLC together, um, but that was about it, really. That was about it. No, uh, it's, it's, no it's, it's, it's like all this sponsorship, it's um, investments, it's, it's all salesmanship. That's, that's basically it. You've got to be enthusiastic and a good salesman. You just it's all salesmanship. You have to ask the question. A lot of people are not comfortable asking the question. A lot of people don't understand. Well, let me show you this here. And that, that question, Derek, is um, in our case, was uh, would you be interested in investing in Spencer? That's it. It's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So see number three in the list here? See, so so, so it, it, I know we only have a short amount of time here, but think about the personal network. Think about the matrix that we just showed you. Think about the investment opportunity. First of all, you gotta make a list. You gotta make a list of all the people that you know, all the people potentially who may be involved. Create your investment or your presentation deck. That's what Spencer did. That's what Barry did for Spencer. That's what we did for Connor. That's what you all have done. That's what Aaron Tielitz did. Have your elevator speech ready. You know what an elevator speech is. You happen to get onto an elevator with the CEO of a company, you're gonna go up 10 floors, you got, you got 30 <laughs> seconds to say something. Now, so here's how the elevator speech go. Hey, uh, how, hello, how are you? Yeah, hey, uh, um, I'm gonna, I'm trying to, um, I'm, I'm a racing driver, and I want to, um, if you, now, so you have a company and it's big, and so uh, I need a sponsor, and so, um, 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 would you sponsor me? Because I'm good. <laughs> no. Now, so if the elevator speech goes, hi, I'm Spencer Piggott, I'm Derek Dayton. I'm a young American, I've got a dream, I'm gonna try and make it to the Indy 500. I just know me or my family are not in a position to get me there financially, but I'm a, I have a great story. Would you be interested in listening to see, might you help me? You see how different that is? It's only taking 30 seconds. And so you can write that down and have a prepared elevator speech, because you have to emotionally hook the person first for him to want to know. And so his question was, would you be interested in supporting Spencer Piggott, an athlete, a young American athlete who's gonna try and do something that's extremely difficult. So the elevator speech is really important. Develop a relationship three years before he got some of the sponsorships. A year after I asked my first sponsor for support, he came back and called me because he followed me for that year. Five years after relationships, we've still been able to activate some of those. Create and you use distribution list, stand on the podium. Stand on the podium. It is driven by on track success. Anybody got any questions? I saw one more question. Did you have a question, Tom? I was just going to ask how you determine the value of the share. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. Good. Uh, um, Good. Yeah. It was basically yeah. just reverse engineered from, well, how much do we need? <laughs> and then just go back from that. Okay, good. So we're right on you time here. Gentlemen. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. I just want to say that if, if anybody is seriously interested in groups like this, I hope that um, my own letter in Minnesota, they do have lots of groups that come down to this group. They're very interested in helping you know, NBA guys, you know, other guys like this. And it's like a very interesting company that sets us off. Like with the structure? Yeah, with the structure. Okay, great. Yeah, so I mean, check with your local colleges if they have a lot of groups to talk to. I know we're able to discuss that. Yeah. 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 Barry, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good luck. Okay, so I want to stay right on time here. Now, we, we'll be around here afterwards if anybody wants to have a chat about anything that you've seen here. But because we're in a largely unstructured sport, I fully understand how when parents jump in, it's a massive project to try and understand and wrap your arms around how or what steps do we take to make our way through here? Because you got development steps for the driver, as we showed you earlier, and then these support steps are so vitally important. And so in this short time, we can just give you a feel for the concept. But what we've shown you are real, live, up-to-date storylines of how young drivers in our junior system today were able to get funded 
Then their on-track success led them to scholarships, which led them to more funding from emotionally engaged people and more investors, and it just keeps the momentum going. But don't misunderstand how much work this is. Now, Honda are obviously very sensitive to the grassroots family. So we've gone a level deeper than seminars, and they've actually created um, a grassroots video development grass for grassroots series. Um, before everybody leaves here, you can take a copy of this uh, business card, which has the URL on it for you to access this before it comes out. It's not out until January, but you can go online. Uh, they'll ask you probably for your email address, but you can go online and see the first of the five modules that we produced to literally allow families across the table in their own kitchens to plug in all the steps they will need to make, the development steps for the driver, the support steps that they will need to take as a family to start this new family business. And it's a five module set which covers basically the first five years of a young driver's development program. And it's, it's information that has never been made available before in a condensed fashion. So make sure before you leave, everybody gets a copy of this URL because it's very informative. Now, let's, let's wrap it up here because I see a lot of young drivers here all hopeful that maybe you'll get a chance to do or to live your dream like I did. But, but let me throw another little piece in here as, 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 we, uh, as we wrap up. No matter what we say here, no matter what you hear, no matter what Honda makes available to you, do not misunderstand how difficult this will be. This is a lifestyle commitment for drivers and for families. This is a dedication. This is a, a, a lifestyle, a new lifestyle that you will develop. And I always go back to my work ethic slide. And I happen to use this particular slide with Jimmy Johnson last year, right here, because I took a quote from Chad Knauss, who's a friend of mine. He said, Jimmy Johnson is charting new territory in NASCAR, and that's due to a combination of natural talent and his unsurpassed work ethic. Now, do you think it's a coincidence that he just happened to win another NASCAR championship? Do you think, was it, was it driven by an unsurpassed work ethic? Because there is no free lunch here. And this is the greatest sport for uncovering every weakness any driver or any package might have. You can't hide anything in our sport. I'm very familiar with the Rosberg family because in 1982 I was teammates to Nico's dad Keki when he won the world championship. It was, it, was, uh, it, was a, it was a phenomenal year in Formula One. It was actually called the Wild West of Formula One after 1982, because we went through the development of the turbo era, the sliding skirts, the wing cars, the tunnel cars. It was a phenomenal era. And so for me to now see his son, Nico, become world champion. But this quote happened earlier before the start of this season. He said, I've worked to simplify my life and narrow my focus. I'm even more efficient than before. I want absolutely nothing to distract me. It's all of these little things that count in the end. I'm now fully in world championship mode. Now, he may not be the fastest, most gifted driver in the world, but he's awful close. But his package, his whole package of a complete champion is arguably as good as anybody's. And that quote was made before the season ever started. Would anybody argue that his work ethic was absolutely focused on the task at hand to the point where he found the pressure, the emotional pressure, the mental pressure of challenging for the world championship so much he didn't want to do it anymore because he put all of his life into that one world championship. And so there's no easy way through this. Don't think that if you get sponsorship or you get an investor or you get funding this year and you're on your way, that you can sit back. The rest is going to take care of itself. Barry Piggott works every single day 
still trying to get Spencer established in the sport. Connor knows the effort I put in initially, he now puts in to try and get himself in a position to get himself established across that line where you're now established and you have the experience. There is no shortcut. Now, when we labeled these seminars, what if it's you? Some of you remember how that came about. What if it's you? That came about because the question is, if Roger Penske or Chip Ganassi or Michael Andretti are going to make a phone call to a young driver in five years' time and say, I'd like you to drive for my team, what if it's you that gets the call? What will you have to do in the next five years? What skills will you have to develop? What skills will your support system have to make sure are developed and in place for you to get that call? Joseph Newgarden got the call this year. He spent the last five years demonstrating that he has the talent for Roger Penske to take a chance on. Roger Penske's attitude right now is we're going to give him an opportunity to get to the next level. They don't believe he's a champion yet. They're going to give him an opportunity to get to the next level. That's what we all want. What does the next level look like for a team like Roger Penske's, for example? I pull this quote that I use regularly in my corporate uh, keynotes. Roger Penske has said to many people, and he's quoted, I don't just put people in a position to be the best they can be. I like to put people in a position where they want to be the best they can be. When you add that word want, it puts people into a category that is top team, top shelf material. And if you don't want it, it's okay. You can enjoy the sport. But the sport and the champions will continue on the way because they want it. Roger Penske has 14,000 employees today. In the first pay packet of every employee, he puts this coin. They minted their own coins, right? No wonder he has so much money. He mints his own. <laughs> anyway, so the reason I know this is when I was in television broadcasting, I did one track test a year. I started off with the Williams Formula One car of Paul Ricard in 94. The next year, Alan Sir Jr. won the championship in the Penske. I called Roger, said, would you give me a run in Alan Sir Jr.'s car? He said, yes. The morning I arrived in Nazareth to drive the car, I got a Penske coin. And look at the back of it. The back of the Penske coin says effort equals results. He got that from his dad. It's on his desk. It's in his race shop because he wants everybody to buy into effort equals results. Now, do you think if he lives by that mantra, and if you think you already know the type of people he wants, can you fit into that, in through that filter? You see, it's already laid out. You know what the top teams expect. You know what you have to do. And the reason we're all here is because Honda is trying to create a platform and HPD that people have at least a path to understand what might be possible and give a clear picture of the, what the paddock looks like if you ever get there. But the key is everybody here gets to make a choice. Greatest power we all possess is the power to choose. Choose whether all the information that you hear or that goes over the top of your head or maybe there's nuggets in there that you can take and you can use to be part of your package as you grow. Because my hope for all the people that I meet at these seminars is that the next time I meet you, it might be on the podium. How cool would that be? And if we can provide you with information to get you on the podium, then we've had a good mission. Here's something I used last year too, and this is our complete wrap, here, wrap up here. You will not decide your future, you decide your habits. Your habits then in turn decide your future. And so ask yourself, are your habits on a daily basis aligned with one of those big team managers making the call to you? 
if they are aligned and you develop the skills and your support team develops the skills, what if it's you could become real in five or six years' time? Last thing I'll leave you with, we do not attract what we want. We attract what we are. Are we positioned to get the call from one of the great teams in the future? My hope is yes.